This is what happens in Somalia if you get malaria or a life-threatening illness. In this video, I'm going to talk about how healthcare works here, and afterwards I'm going to share a bit of a grim personal story. So, as I've mentioned before, it can be kind of hard to get health insurance here. The country of Somalia has had some bad press in recent history, so this video might just save your life. That said, to be honest, healthcare is less of a concern in a country where you have a more active lifestyle. We've been here nearly two years now, and we've just realised that we get sick a lot less, because we're breathing fresh air all the time, we're eating healthier food, we're having a more balanced lifestyle and we're just outside more of the time as there's nice weather all of the time. So that is something to consider if you're worried about your healthcare here. But let me tell you a story about my experience with the healthcare system here just to give you an insight on how things work. After we'd been here for about eight months, my eldest son Yusuf, who's seven, got pretty sick. He had a really high temperature, lost his appetite, some of those typical symptoms. So we took him to the hospital and we got him checked. The first thing that I noticed is that there are very, very low wait times at hospitals here. Admittedly, you need to pay a couple of dollars to be seen, but it shouldn't be the case that the NHS wait times are like 10 hours for A&E, but you can turn up to a hospital in Somalia and be seen within a few minutes. It just seems a bit backwards to me. I mean, I love and miss many, many things about my home country of England, but NHS wait times are not one of them. So Yusuf got seen, they did a blood test, they did all of these usual tests, and lo and behold, they came back and they said that he has malaria. Malaria is actually treated quite easily here. Coming from the UK and hearing stories of people having malaria growing up, like my great-grandfather, for example, he served in the military, and he had lived in many countries across Africa and Asia including India and Madagascar and Iraq and Iran and many of these countries throughout like the 20s and 30s and he got malaria and when he came back to England there were horror stories of his relapses and things like that throughout our family so I always believed malaria was this thing that you would definitely die from but here in Somalia they just give you a jab in a big muscle and it's pretty much over with. But in any case, they gave him this jab, and it was pretty late by this point, so they said they would keep him in hospital, and they'd give him some drips and things like that, because he'd lost a lot of fluids. My wife called me. She was like, Sam, get yourself over to the hospital, come and see Yusuf, he wants to see you. So once again, I found myself getting a bajaj and making my way across Mogadishu. And I came to the hospital, and I decided to spend the night in the hospital with Yusuf and with my wife, because she had also got, got malaria as well. So when I was in the hospital with her, we had some friends who lived near the hospital who came and brought me some food, because um, I hadn't eaten. So I had this food and I went into the I went into like the waiting area. And as I was sat there, I went to go and wash my hands and stuff. And when I came back, I sat there just eating with my hands like you do. And then after I'd eaten, I went to go and just sleep next to my son in, um, in the hospital. And then the next morning I woke up and I just had these really awful aches in my body. And I thought, you know, I've done a bit of a difficult workout the day before. Maybe I'm just aching, right, from a difficult workout or whatever. So the morning went on and I was like, come on, let's just go home. Like, we're ready to go home. I just want to go home. I started to get a high temperature. I started to feel sick. I started to have aches in my joints. And I just said to my wife, look, I don't want to be seen or anything. I don't want to be seen by anybody. I just want to go home. Let's get a bajaj. I'm going home by myself. So I went home and I actually had meetings with a company that I work for called Arabic Unlocked. And we had meetings that afternoon and I literally couldn't even get up to pray duhur. Like I got up and it took me about half an hour to make wudu. I was in that much pain in my joints. I just had no idea what it was. So eventually it got to the point where I wasn't able to make my meetings for work. And so I had to cancel those and I called my wife and when she came back to the house, she was like, look, you look awful and you need to get back to the hospital. And I thought, well, I just have malaria as well. I thought I definitely have malaria because you guys have had malaria. And if a mosquito's bitten you and then in the same night it's decided to munch on me as well, I've definitely got malaria too. So what we did is we called one of our friends who's a doctor and said, can you come over, bring the malaria jabs and just get me sorted? And he was like, look, from your symptoms, it might not be malaria. There's a bunch of things that it could be. Get yourself back to the hospital and we'll run blood tests. So there I am getting back in the bajaj. It took me like, I don't know, 20 minutes to get down the stairs. My, my joints were in so much pain. I've, I've never felt like that before in my life, right? We get into a bajaj once again. We get back to the hospital. We get in the hospital and get checked in and everything. They put the little drips in me and um, they run a blood test. And lo and behold, I have typhoid. Now, people can die from typhoid if it's not treated properly. And it was pretty annoying for me as well, because I've actually been vaccinated against typhoid, but apparently the vaccinations don't protect you against all strands. Where have we heard that before? Now, typhoid is something which is transmitted usually through food or water that's been contaminated. And I have no idea where that came from. Perhaps when I was eating that dinner with my hands in the waiting room, perhaps my hands, I hadn't washed my hands properly or something like that. And basically, I'd got typhoid. So what do you do about typhoid? But let's talk about medicine and prescriptions a little bit. So typhoid is something that you need to have antibiotics for, and usually it can clean up within a few days. Some people do actually pull through it themselves, I think, but, um, but it's worth having antibiotics and stuff like that too. And here's the thing here in Somalia, okay? 
Rare UK, right? People from the UK. It's often hard for us to understand that hospitals are essentially businesses in other countries. So when you go to a hospital in another country, and this includes Somalia, and you get your prescriptions and things like that, just make sure that everything they're giving you does align with the symptoms and the issues that you have. Trust your doctors. I'm not saying you should constantly pick apart whatever your doctors prescribe for you and stuff, but just make sure they haven't accidentally included a bunch of medicine that you really don't need. Because I've seen lots of people coming out of hospitals here in Somalia with bags and bags full of prescriptions. So what did they give me? Okay, so they sent me home with a bunch of stuff, which has thankfully gone into my body now and isn't actually here. But these are some examples of some things I'll show you that here in Somalia, hospitals will often send you home with, which is a bit of a learning curve for us. Syringes. I have never seen a hospital in the UK send patients home who are untrained to administer syringes into themselves before. I've never seen that. Now, to be fair, these ones aren't usually to actually go in your body, right? It's often if they give you a drip, these are actually to go in the drip, to add, to add something into your drips, right? If you're having something through the IV. But then there are also, also these scalp vein sets as well. People do administer these themselves here in Somalia. It's quite common for people to actually use these themselves. So... You know, I don't know, I've seen some people having ruptures in their hands and stuff through putting them in themselves, but, but it seems quite common in the culture here. Lots of people know how to do it themselves. Like, the same way in the UK, like, lots of people grow up maybe knowing a bit about how to do CPR or whatever. In school, maybe we do first aid treatments. Here, lots of people know how to administer these. Like, loads of my neighbours and stuff, they could just come over and they could just put my antibiotics in for me. But that's not something that we're really used to from the UK. So quite often when you get your prescriptions, they'll send you home with these kinds of things. They'll send you home with the sorf and the shorotto. And they'll send you home with kinini as well. I'm I'm not sure who was prescribed these ones actually, but I just wanted to show you the canini. And when they prescribe them to you, they'll tell you how frequently you need to take them by just putting lines on them. Like that just means you need one a day. So I was sent home with a bunch of antibiotics, a bunch of syringes and injections and stuff. And of course, like my Somali is okay to get around the city and to explain the things that I need, but it's not necessarily good enough to understand all the medical terms. So I wasn't a hundred percent sure what to do. I got on the phone to friends of mine who are doctors and my little sister's a practicing doctor in the UK as well, saying, I've got all this medicine. How do I get it in my body? And it was a bit stressful because I was also really unwell. I was just in a mess, really. And half the people around me are recovering from malaria, so it's not like I've got tons of support around me for it. But thankfully, the hospital had actually organised a nurse to come and visit me the next day to actually get the antibiotics straight into my veins. So I was worrying for nothing, really. The hospital had taken care of it. A nurse actually came to our house the next day and for the next three days to do my antibiotics for me, so it was no problem at all. And was actually a very high level of healthcare, relatively cheap as well. Speaking of relative cheap. I'll just tell you a bit about how much the costs of going to hospital and things like that are as well. Like some of our brothers and sisters from America, for you guys, the idea of getting healthcare without health insurance is the same as like needing to buy a house every week or something. So for the past nearly two years that we've been living here, we've spent about $250 on medical care. And that includes all of our prescriptions, it includes being seen by the doctors, it even includes a couple of scans and things like that. Some things that cost hundreds or even thousands of pounds in other parts of the world. And bear in mind, we've had nurses come to our house to come and administer medicine for us as well. So fairly routine stuff like trips to the hospital to see a doctor for a general checkup or being administered medicine for malaria or gem general things like that. Like you're not talking about much more than sort of $50 for something like that. But if you need to stay in a hospital overnight, a place in a hospital bed overnight might be about $60 a night or something like that. I managed to avoid that because I said, I don't want to sleep here. I want to go home and get a good night's sleep. I had all the medicine that I needed. So I just went home and went to bed. Thank you so much for watching and for being interested in my journey here in Somalia. If you want to watch any more of my previous videos about life here, I've gone ahead and picked out one specially for you and I've put it right there for you to enjoy. See you in the next one. Assalamu alaikum.